Hello, and welcome to Lab 6, Ocean Waves. The life cycle of a wave consists of four phases, beginning with wave birth. Wave birth is the formation of waves as the result of storms, winds, or some type of disturbance. Once the wave is generated, it will disperse. This is known as wave school. The distance a wave travels across the water is also known as fetch. As waves interact with the shoreline, they progressively deform through what's known as shoaling. This is called wave work. When a wave's energy encounters the seafloor, the speed of the wave slows, it steepens, and its height increases. The wave will continue to steepen and it forms a crest. Wave death, or the eventual wave collapse, occurs when the height to water depth ratio exceeds 75%. This breaking ratio is called surf. Wave types. Ocean waves, also known as swells, are classified as four types. Deep water waves, intermediate water waves, shallow water waves, and very shallow water waves. Deep water waves move the fastest as they are uninhibited by shoaling. Progressively, each type of wave slows in speed until eventual collapse at the shore. In this lab, you will later learn that each wave type has what's known as a wave base, or the lowest depth of a disturbance. Additionally, you'll learn that the wave base varies for each wave type and is based on the differences between wavelength and period. The anatomy of a wave. The anatomy of a wave consists of a crest, or the highest point on a wave, trough, the lowest point, the still water level, which is the sea surface when there are, are no waves, height measured crest to trough, and wavelength measured crest to crest. The anatomy of a shoreline consists of some of the following features. One, beach. Two, surf zone. Three, surf. Four, wave crest. Five, wavelength. Six, deep water wave, seven, trough, eight, wave height. Next, using figure five from your lab, you'll learn how to determine the behavior of a wave, whether it's a deep water, intermediate, shallow, or very shallow wave, and how it's classified, whether it's a ripple, chop, sea, swell, tsunami, or a tide. You can use this chart when given a known water depth, as seen here on the y-axis, measured in meters, and also a given known period, seen across the x-axis, measured in seconds. Note that both axes are log scale. For example, if you're given a known ocean bathymetry of 1,000 meters and a wave period of 10 seconds, you can determine that the wave is a deep water wave, and it's classified as a swell. Wave base. Beneath the wave, water particles produce elliptical orbits. With depth, these orbitals form progressively smaller diameters until motion essentially stops. This is known as wave base. Wave base is the maximum depth at which a wave's energy causes motion. Beneath the wave base, sediments will no longer be stirred by the wave motion. Next, you will learn that the wave base is directly related to wavelength, roughly one half wavelength for a deep water wave. Wavelength. Wavelength is the distance between two peaks in a wave. For a deep water wave, the wave base is one half the wavelength and is determined by the water depth. For example, for a given deep water wave with a wavelength of five meters, using the following formula, where D is greater than one half wavelength, D representing depth of the wave base. If you were to plug in this formula, you would calculate that the wave base for this specific wave is 2.5 meters. In this lab, you will use the following wave measurements to complete your calculations for part A. Wavelength is a measure of crest to crest. Wave height is a measure from crest to trough. 
Wave period is a measure of crest to crest, but in time, and amplitude, which is one half the height. Again, in part A, you will use these measurements to calculate wave speed, wave base, group speed, water depth, and the wave break. Also in part A, you will find the formulas to perform your calculations in this, in this following table. Across the top of the table, you will see wave-based formulas for each wave type. You'll notice that the wave-based formulas vary. For example, for a deep water wave, you would use one half wavelength, whereas for shallow water waves, you would use 1 20th wavelength. The differences in wave base is based on the wavelength that varies with the different forms of waves. For deep water waves calculations, you would use the following column. For wave speed calculations, you would use the following row. Where these two, where the column and row meets, you'll find your formulas. The formula that you choose for your calculations is based upon the information that's given in the question. For example, if the question only provides period or T, then you would use the following wave speed formula uh, to, to calculate your wave speed. For example, wave speed equals 1.56 times your period or T. Remember, length, depth, height are all measurements of distance. Period is measure of time. Speed is a measure of meters per second. And also in your calculations, you'll use the gravitational constant of 9.8 meters per second squared. For this lab, we, we will perform virtual experiments in the San Diego State University Oceans Wave Room. Specifically, we will utilize the wave base float tank, the hand paddle tank, and the coastal erosion simulation table. The wave-based float tank. In the wave-based float tank, it utilizes buoyed floats that are anchored to various depths to illustrate the wave base. When the paddle is turned on, waves are generated. The wavelengths are determined by varying the paddle speed. In this first demonstration, the wave paddle speed will be set to high in order to simulate shallow water waves. Here you can see that the relatively short wavelengths are translated into a shallow wave base, hence only the top two floats show movement. In this next demonstration, the wave paddle speed is set to low in order to uh, simulate deep water waves. Here you can see that the relatively long waves, wavelengths are translated to, deep, uh, to a deeper wave base, hence all of the floats show movement. For our next experiment, we will move to the hand paddle tank. In this experiment, we will calculate the observed wave speed measured in centimeters per second using the time it takes for a wave to cross the tank four times or to complete two round trips. We will repeat this experiment for four uh, water level depths, depths of three, six, nine, and 12 centimeters. To complete your calculation, you'll need to know the tank length, which is 200 centimeters, or a total of 800 centimeters total distance. Remember, wave speed will be calculated in centimeters per second. Also, you will need to use your timer for this experiment. So pause the training video and get ready. For our first experiment, we will record the wave travel time required for two round trips in, a three, in three centimeters of water. To do this experiment, you will start your timer once the wave returns to the beginning of the tank. You will then watch the wave move back and forth four times. You will stop your timer upon the completion of the four trips.
if you ac accurately timed all four trips, the results should be approximately 14.3 seconds. Notice the relatively slow speed of the wave because of the shallow depth. This is due to the shoaling effect or the wavelength reflecting with the bottom of the tank. In our next experiment, we'll increase the water level to six centimeters and repeat the experiment. Get ready with your timer. Again, if you accurately timed the demonstration, the results should be approximately 10.1 seconds. Next, we'll increase the tank depth to nine centimeters and repeat. Again, if you accurate, accurately timed the four trips, the resulting time should be approximately eight seconds. And finally, we increase the water depth to 12 centimeters and repeat the experiment. Here you will notice that the time for the four round traps were significantly faster with a result of approximately 6.6 .6 seconds. This is a result of the wave base being higher than the lowest portion of the tank. Next, we will see what happens when two waves meet. In this demonstration, two waves are generated in opposite directions. You'll notice the following. Waves move through each other like ghosts and the wave amplitude is additive when the waves meet. Next, we will discuss longshore current and littoral drift. A longshore current is an ocean current that moves parallel to the shore. It's caused by swells sweeping into the shoreline at an angle, pushing water down the length of the coast in one direction. This creates what's known as littoral drift. Littoral drift is the net movement of sand along the coast. Driven by the longshore current, the net transport of sand is parallel to the coast. We will now conduct experiments which demonstrate longshore current and littoral drift. For our next experiments, we will move to the erosion simulation table. In this experiment, sand representing a coastline has been built at an angle to the incoming waves. This is done in order to simulate the longshore current and littoral drift. As waves impact the coastline, sand is transported downstream or is seen in, in this image from top to bottom. Notice at the end of this video, you will see an accumulation of sand along the glass towards the bottom.
In this demonstration, we accurately show the migration of sand in the form of littoral drift moving downstream along an angled coastline. Again, at the bottom of the screen, we can see the accumulation of sand. With a normal coastline, sand will naturally migrate down the coast. In our next experiment, we use the same angled coastline. However, we have now included a small inlet or an embayment uh, within our coastline. With no protection, you'll see that the longshore current and littoral drift will quickly fill and erode the inlet. Again, this accurately shows how the longshore current and littoral drift are migrating sand down the coast. 
the inlet has been basically completely filled and eroded away. In our next demonstration, we will use the same angled coastline and installed embayment or inlet. However, a jetty has been placed to protect the upstream side of uh, the inlet. So after five minutes of wave action, we've seen a few, a uh, couple of different specific results. One, we noticed that the coastline upstream from the jetty completely eroded. That's because of the glass panel within the tank. There is no sand supply, which means the wave action was able to quickly penetrate and remove the sand. If there were, uh, if there was a sand migration upstream or above the jetty, 
we would see an accumulation of sand as we do towards the bottom of the tank. One of the problems with jetty is the accumulation of the sand on the upstream side, as well as stand, uh, sand starvation to coastlines uh, that are downstream. However, the jetty was effective in protecting the upstream side of the inlet. In our final demonstration, a breakwater has been placed in front of the angled coastline. As waves impact the breakwater, wave energy is reflected back to sea. You'll notice also that waves will refract around the breakwater. This will result in a net accumulation of sand behind the breakwater.
Hopefully in this demonstration, you were able to notice the waves reflecting back out to the ocean, as well as refracting around each side of the breakwater. You'll see that there's a noticeable accumulation of sand behind the breakwater. Also downstream, because of an angled coastline, we have our sand accumulation along the glass. Refraction. Refraction is the change in direction of propagating waves. It occurs when one part of a wave encounters a shallower depth. The wave over a shallower water will slow, causing deeper water portions to bend inward or to refract. As seen in the following figures, in the top figure, white curved lines represent incoming waves that are refracting towards the coast. Yellow orthogonal lines demonstrate refraction. Refraction can be caused by headlands and embayments. A headland is a narrow piece of land that projects from a coastline. An embayment is a recess on a coastline forming a bay. Reflection. Reflection occurs when wave energy is returned seaward or reflected. This occurs on headlands, Reflections also occur with breakwaters. Again, a breakwater is a barrier built into a body of water that protects the coastline from the force of waves. Orthogonals. Orthogonals are lines that are drawn on a map indicating local wave direction. When drawn correctly, they cross exactly perpendicular to each wave crest. drawing orthogonals. In this example, a coastline is depicted with the water sand barrier being bar uh, marked by a dark sandy beach with white lines representing wave crests. To correctly draw orthogonals, you'll begin at the white tick marks on the deep water side for each side of the lines A, B, and C. You'll then make small perpendicular tick marks along each ocean wave crest leading towards the coastline. You'll then connect the tick marks to form your orthogonal. Some orthogonals may be straight lines along linear coastlines or curve in or out relevant to embayments and headlands. In the last section of your lab, you will use the wave orthogonal method. As illustrated in this figure, you'll draw orthogonals for areas A, B, and C, beginning at the white tick marks on the deep water side. You'll then measure the deep water distribution in millimeters, following measurements on the shallow water distribution, again in millimeters. You'll then complete the table I'm sorry, let me back up. You'll then complete the table using the wave coefficient, which is the shallow water distribution divided by the deep water distribution. Thank you for attending Lab 6 Ocean Waves. Please address your questions to your lab TA.